All right, let's go ahead and get started. It's 12.01. Um, can you, you guys can see my the PowerPoint presentation, the screen, right? Yes, we can see your screen. <clears throat> Hi, everyone. Hi, glad to have you join us and glad to have um, all of our other audience members in here as well. Uh, we'll go ahead and get started. So good afternoon and welcome to the Sage Investor webinar. My name is Jen and I am a co-founder of the Sage Investing Group along with Maggie and Lana. We really appreciate you guys being here today. Um, if you guys have any questions during the course of the presentations, just feel free to type them into the chat box so you don't forget and we'll address them at the end. So just a little background about the three of us before we get started. Um, all of us, we have a big four accounting background, which means that our background is rooted in audit and risk management. Um, as, uh, as auditors, we tend to ask a lot of questions and we never really believe anything anyone says unless we see the evidence. So as you can see, auditors are not very popular, but we see a lot of value in what we do and how it can help other investors in this multifamily space. So you'll see some evidence of this in today's presentation. Uh, so now we use our combined 35 years of professional experience in audit, accounting, and finance, along with our real estate investing experience and the thousands of hours that we've spent so far underwriting multifamily deals to do what we do today in multifamily syndications. And that is we critically vet deals and we help busy professionals like you guys invest with greater confidence in these syndications. So today's webinar is actually an encore of our presentation a few weeks ago at a multifamily investing conference in Dallas, Texas. And the ladies are very modest and they won't admit it themselves, but they are darn good underwriters. And so they're so good that they were actually asked to present on a deal that our team underwrote and almost had under contract. And in this presentation, we share with the other operators and investors in the room, um, the lessons that we gleaned from this experience so that they too can learn from it for their own deals. Um, and a few other, a few housekeeping items before we start today, we just wanna let you know that some of these things we talk about, uh, we try to cater the presentation to the investors, to, for more of the investors, um, but the core you know, ideas are still there. Um, so if anything is still too technical, we'll, we're happy to um, answer any questions you have at the end. And for the sake of respecting the sellers in this situation, um, we will not be disclosing the property's name or the location. And lastly, I have to warn you that this presentation will probably be more than 30 minutes long, but it's well worth it. Uh, but we completely understand that if you guys need to drop off early, we won't be offended. Uh, we will be sending you a recording later anyways. So with that said, um, since we're mostly presenting to uh, investors today, we just catered it a bit, to, uh, a bit more to you guys. So we just hope that um, after today's webinar, you guys will shine some light on um, some takeaways, which is what goes on behind the scene before a deal is ever presented to the investors. Um, which will also shine some light on what the Sage Investing Group's due diligence process is like when we source our own multifamily acquisitions and also um, why we decided to ultimately walk away from a deal that we had invested so much time, energy, and even money into. So here we go. This is a case study presentation of a deal we almost had under contract. I'm gonna pass it along to Maggie now, uh, who will kick off the presentation. Thanks, Jen. Um, so we hear a lot of times in case studies that a deal of deals that go really well, but hearing the tough story can be just as valuable, if not more than a good deal. So without further ado, and over the next 30 minutes or so, we're going to share with you, this is a story all about how a deal got flipped, turned upside down. So let me take a moment, so sit right there as I take you through the story with Fresh Prince of Bel Air. <laughs> a little delay there, but. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Now, I hope all you heard that rap in Will Smith voice. Uh, so before uh, we get into it, I uh, just want to share a little bit of background about us and those, and for those who don't know us and how that plays into this deal. 
the three of us are recovering auditors in the past life. So it is our uh, nature to look for risks um, or the worst case scenarios of any deal. And some of you may have known this already, uh, having to work with us before. And we do this with the best intention of drawing out as many potential potholes so we know how to face them should they occur or account for them appropriately in our underwriting. So how we look at our own deal is no different. And so we are here today to share a little insight on our processes and procedures and how one of, the, one of our deals got flipped upside down. Okay, so let's get right into it. Um, on a high level, here are some notes we want to share. First, this is a 152 unit property built in 1970s. The, um, and it was also floated us to off market. And it was a floor to us as a value add opportunity in the market that we come to know very well. And between ourselves and our partners, we had a few properties in the market. Our partners also had a very good relationship with the on-site property manager and also the, as well the owner of this particular property. So now um, as for the projected returns, it was our goal, it was our goal and still is for many of our deals today to look for these type of returns, 10% cash on cash, 100% total return and 15% um, IRR or internal rate of return. And this deal is no different. Uh, we submitted that offer pencil in at 10.4% cash on cash, 105 total return and 15.3 IRR. Not bad, right? But after due diligence, we ran a few scenarios and based on additional information collected, we were landing as low as 8.5% cash on cash and as low as 6% internal rate of return, which obviously does not meet our investor return goals. So let us take you through the nitty gritty on what actually happened. So first off, just one caveat, when you're in the deal, the reality is things are chaotic and a lot of events are happening simultaneously. So we put together a more simplified timeline for the purpose of this webinar, because we think it's what's important here is to take you guys through our thinking process on and why some of the decisions were made at that moment in time. So we broke down a timeline over three months and this happened in September, October and November of 2020. So month one. Month one, this deal came to our attention and we underwrote it, review it and submitted an offer. And it was a great deal. And month two, we got awarded a deal. We conduct our due diligence with early access. And month three, right when we were about to start the purchase sales agreement or the PSA process, we realized this deal that was once a great deal became a dead deal, like six feet under the ground dead. So let's break down our month one process. So the deal get flowed to us, as we mentioned, off market and their asking price was $92,000 a door. And the broker is sharing this as a value add opportunity, but there was actually already had been a, over $3 million worth of capital expenditure infused into the property over the last few years. With new windows, new doors, new sidings, HVAC, and so on and on and on and on. So while, while this is a 1970s vintage product, it really did not feel like it. It felt more like a early 90s or late uh, 2000 or 2000 product. So um, what's our thought originally on this? Well, the opportunity seemed simple in that there was one already proof of concept. Uh, they already renovated more than half of the units there. So we really just need to finish out the remaining 60 to 70 units to bring it up to the fully renovated unit level. And second, the other thing that was, uh, that was really exciting about this property was it was located in a clear prof path of progress in that it was very close to a brand new retail store such as Starbucks, Target, Lowe's and newly developed class A apartments with full fledged top of the line amenities. So it's a very good location. However, as we said earlier, with so much capital infused already, we really weren't sure if there was enough meat on the bone per se uh, for us to work with as a value add strategy and also hit our investor returns. So we actually passed on it originally, but at the insistence of the broker and us wanted to continue fostering this relationship with them, we decided to take a look at it anyway. So we underwrote it just to see and share our feedback with the broker. And we were pleasantly surprised to see it actually pencil out really well. And that's us. 
dancing. <laughs> and, and as you can see um, in the beginning, as you, can, as you saw in the beginning, we were landing pretty nicely at 10.4% cash on cash, 105% total return, and 15.3% internal rate of return. Not bad. And this was using pretty conservative underwriting where we had penciled in year one economic vacancy of over 20%. And we kept year one income growth at 0%. Uh, and we penciled in also agency debt, uh, even though the return looks better in the, using a bridge loan scenario. So now that it passed our initial underwriting, it's time to proceed through a typical procedure before we submit a LOI or letter of intent. And this includes the following. One, we check in with our lender to confirm the loan terms. Two, we get preliminary insurance quotes. And three, we get uh, property manager feedbacks and multiple in some cases because they are the expert in the market to give you the insight on your performance or your projections. Uh, we also get water saving um, estimates, um, not in all property, but in this particular property, particular property, uh, the water sewer bill looked pretty high. So we actually consulted the water cons conservation consultant. Uh, we also look up uh, the look through and comb through the tax assessor website for the county to under get an understanding of how they how they project how to project the potential for tax increases in our uh, during our whole period. And uh, last, uh, we also circle up with a few other partners besides the three of us to give us some more feedback to further refine our underwriting just to make sure we didn't miss anything. So ultimately, will they continue? tweaking and retweaking the analyzer of all the quotes and feedbacks that we were getting, we realized that we were still able to hit our target return while still keeping a few levers in our back pocket that will further help our numbers. Uh, and we kept that as a reserve um, and as levers to pull on should we need it. And these levers include recognizing water, water savings um, from the estimate that was provided from the water conservation consultant. Uh, we originally allow for about 30% of the savings to come through our projection, just to be, cons just to be conservative. Uh, other measure that we could take was um, uh, establishing energy saving investments such as LED lighting, which will help us in two ways. One is to reduce the utility expense. And second, we could also apply for a green reward program with the lender that could further decrease our debt expense. Uh, the other stuff that we have in the back pocket was to uh, additional in other income, such as providing a internal service package for which we could get a share of the income. Uh, setting up, um, we could also do setting up a private fencing for some of the units so pet owners can allow their pets to run free in their own yard and we can also charge higher rent on. Additionally, this property also had very unique, uh, was very unique in that it has a few buildings that had unused basements, uh, which could easily be converted into storage for additional rent. So, um, so this is all, all in our back pocket. So at this point, well, initial underwriting, uh, it looks pretty good. And uh, so the next thing we did do, we do was to prepare the uh, LOI or the offer and to talk it over among our partners before we submit it. Because it is off-market deal, uh, you won't be able to see a lot more details when compared to a fully marketed deal. So we wanted to talk through the amounts of sales, the potential risk that we may we may encounter. Okay, now, now we are in the middle of COVID, so something we are worried about is how collection was going, and we did see some balances on the rent roll. So we wanted to dig in and get more information. We especially wanted to get the cash income statement to see how the actual collection was been, has been doing or has been going. Uh, we were only, at that time, we were only given the accrual, accrual based income statement. But given this is an off market deal, is one of those things that you aren't going to get more information unless you proceed further in the next step to show that you're seriously interested because otherwise the seller aren't willing to waste their time. Um, and for this, uh, and for this, oh, for those who are not familiar, cash income statement shows uh, actual cash collections versus an accrual income statement uh, will show what is expected to be collected, and but not necessarily what is actually collected. So that's the difference between cash and accrual basis. And because we don't have the cash income financials, 
we were resorted to run on a performa on a accrual based income statement. So there is a potential risk that a cash income statement might come out drastically different from the accrual based income statement. But absent of being able to get the cash basis, uh, which we try, uh, what gave us comfort was the following. One, it was managed by a well-known reputable property manager. Our partners had also worked with them on other property and therefore was very, very familiar with them. Uh, second, the property was owned by a familiar group and which well, one, of, uh, one of our partner person knew the owners. Third, there was also a recent sales comp of similar vintage that has sold for $87,000 a door in the last six months. But ours actually looks better and it was located in a better area. So at $92,000 door of asking price, it didn't seem that far off or unreasonable. And uh, number four, we still have some, I remember we still have some levers to pull in our back pocket. Um, lastly, we could also uh, build an early access, which we did, that will buy us some time to dig through more details and conduct our physical and financial due diligence before our earnest money or good faith deposit uh, would go hard or become non-refundable. So with that said, we submitted the offer and it got accepted. Yay. So now we move on to month two and where we, this is where we conduct our due diligence during early access. And this is where things get really exciting and interesting. For the physical due diligence piece, we engage a team of experts to do what they do best. And this includes, as an example, we engage a third party company that specialize in physical due diligence to perform unit by unit inspections. And they brought out a team of six people to do the unit walks. Um, the property manager that we engage with also brought up their team of four people to do the unit works. Uh, so there, there's 10 of us, uh, including the three of us and a few other partners. There were, we were running pretty deep over the two and a half days of due diligence on this 152 unit property. So um, there's also a plumber and scoping specialist. The, we also had a, the water saving consultant actually came out as well to confirm the water saving quote that they, he has shared with us. There was also a roofer and as well as the electrician. So while all these experts evaluate the physical condition of this property, um, and we also walk with them um, that day too. But in addition to that, we also did a few things to round out our due diligence uh, as part of our process, which includes driving the comps to check out competitors in the market. Uh, we also drove uh, by the property at night twice. Uh, we, and we also consulted the local PD to get a feel of the crime in that particular area. So uh, and the next thing we do is we also conduct some financial due diligence in the early access. And this includes hiring a tax consult consultant to get comfortable over the estimated performing taxes uh, during our whole period. Um, we also conducted the lease audit. And as mentioned, we were worried about how collections were going. So this is where we really focus our attention to give some insight on what we may be inherited, inheriting before we sign our lives away in, on the PSA. So typically with the lease audits, the property manager that you engage with would do it for you. Uh, but in this case, we also hire another third party, con third party to conduct the lease audit as well. And on top of that, we have the three of us being auditors ourselves, because who else is better to conduct an audit from, from as former auditors as right? So, um, it's, so essentially there are three levels of reviews over these leases. So yeah, we went pretty gun ho on this. <laughs> um, and we also conducted interviews, um, more like a check for the onsite management team. Uh, we really tried to build a report, um, report with them and had lunch with them as well. And during the course of our time with them, uh, we were able to gather some insight with them in regards to physical and the financial condition of the property. Uh, with that said, the insight that we gathered did give us a warning sign as we, as we waited for the data and the final reports from these physical and financial due diligence uh, that was um, being reviewed by these experts that we hired. And what we found was one, the current office manager was only one month into the job. And the maintenance guy was only three weeks into the job. So, okay, just this information wouldn't cause a concern, except there was 
more that we gather. So now I'm going to turn to Lana uh, to share uh, what else we gather during our time and do the lunches. Great. Thanks, Maggie. All right. So now comes the result phase. So kind of going back to what Maggie mentioned, where we did this you know, interviews, which is just us basically chatting with the on-site personnel um, over lunch. There are a couple of things that we start to pick up on that had us raise an eyebrow or two. So first, we were told that many of the residents were employed by the airport, which was less than five minutes away from this property. But because of COVID, they were out of a job or had their hours and paycheck severely cut back. Our initial impression here was general concern that we could potentially be facing a concentration of employment, um, being that there were single employer or industry for the residents at this property. Of course, hearing that residents were losing their jobs or having their pay cut back, it wasn't all too surprising to hear that there were residents claiming hardships and applying for the CDC moratorium. Um, however, it was really bad that there were many, more than 50% of the resident base that had applied for the moratorium that had us pause a little bit. Um, and so naturally we asked, okay, is there any kind of rental assistance program in there um, that might help ease some of this um, tension? Um, and so when we asked that, it was shared to us that this was some of getting some, any kind of rental assistance program was a bit of a challenge um, It was as it was limited in availability in the area. More pause for concern, right? And so, you know, it's quite possible that had we had that cash-based financials all along, we might have started to see dropping collections or that rent income over time, just kind of coinciding with this financial hardship that came with the pandemic. But, you know, as mentioned, we were only given these accrued-based financials, not cash. So we really couldn't tell how severe, if any, these concerns were to the rent collection performance at this time. Okay, so, and of course, while we had the present opportunity to meet with the current existing property management team during our due diligence, we took the chance and asked once more if they could it possibly run for us a cash-based financials while we were on site. And, you know, the team that they had there, as agreeable and helpful as they were, it was starting to dawn on us that this was genuinely something that they weren't, it didn't seem like they were able to produce from their system. So hearing all of this had us worried, of course, uh, but there were some things, a few things that we had to keep in mind. First, I mean, as you heard, there was a recent change in personnel and now the current staff had only been in their respective roles one month or less. And we can't discount the fact that the team, perhaps they were a little bit too new and it's possible that things weren't all as bad as what we were hearing. And then we still had built into our early access contract so we still had some time to complete um, our due diligence, bot further investigate and bottom out some of our concerns. And all of this would be ideally before the initial $75,000 of earnest money deposit that we had put in before that becomes not fundable. So this is where partnering with the right person makes a world of a difference. And in our case, one of our partners, general partners had a relationship with not only the current property manager, but also the owner. So they helped broker some of the questions that we had gathered during this phase of the due diligence. So meanwhile, as our, you know, that partner is reaching out using their network and resources to try to gather more info um, or data points that would help validate or remediate our concerns, we start getting back the results of the due diligence. So first came the physical due diligence. Um, this came from the vendors who physically inspected all 152 units, including the plumbers, roofers, electricians, et cetera. And they share with us that overall, the risk results come in sharing that no major concerns structurally or physically, which is great. Um, and then confirming overall that the property was truly a solid asset. The current manage, the current owners took very well, um, very took care of this property very well. You know, um, so with that said, we start getting back the results of the lease audit, which Maggie mentioned was something we put, paid particular focus to. And remember, we had three layers of review. 
So in combination, when we're looking through the results, we discovered that first, turns out there really wasn't a need to worry about the concentration of jobs with the tenants at this space. The lease audit had actually confirmed for us that there was enough diversity of jobs, employers, and industries. And we made this assessment using that, you know, less than 25% rule of thumb. And on the concern around the high number of applicants for the CDC moratorium and the challenges of getting rental assistance for the tenants, unfortunately, this was one of the areas we weren't able to conclude one way or another, but the concern did merit us to have an open discussion with our PM team who had knowledge of this area since they had properties that they were also managing in the area. And when we asked them that it was in their view that yes, some of these concerns and challenges were reflective of the market, not necessarily the property. And it's something that they had also seen in the properties that they were managing nearby. But what was what they pointed out was it was lesser extent to their properties um, than what was being perceived at this particular property. So we take this and to keep this in mind um, and then think that we might have to just consider this um, upon acquisition. But this in, in and of itself wasn't going to be a deal breaker for us at this point. Now, um, as Maggie mentioned, with the owner infusing three, already $3 million of capital and you know, the renovations being done um, and the level of finishes that they were doing, which included granite countertops, um, stainless steel appliances, et cetera, the property was starting to average $1,000 of rent per unit per month. Um, and Applying that three to one income to rent rule ratio rule of thumb here, we would have anticipated something around $36,000 of at a minimum of average income. So it was a little bit underwhelming to see that the law, lease audit showed us that the average income was just 30,000. It's slightly less than ideal. And then lastly, you know, we expected to see a balance. Maggie mentioned we saw something in the rent roll as well. Um, and at most properties will have one at some point or another, but we were a little bit taken aback to see a balance of over $200,000, half of which was accrued just over the last six to nine months of the property. And many of them were on the new releases that they had just signed. So we get it. Owners want, are really focusing up, focused on leasing, um, leasing up and getting their occupancy rates up but this further cements the importance of screening for quality tenants. Um, and to be fair, it could be that a very large part of this balance was a result of COVID, um, but just something that we had to keep in mind. Now, with a balance of this size, we did consider working something out with the owner as part of our negotiation um, when it comes to the PSA. But reality was that even for those units, we could legitimately file evictions on, we had to face a real issue that when court would finally reopen as it was planned for January of this, the following year in this area, there's going to be a backlog of processing these evictions, something we have to consider as part of our acquisition plan for this property. Okay. And not to be more of a negative Nancy, but that cash-based financials we were looking for and that the partner was helping us out on, we never got it. Um, super fun. So luckily, because we had that one partner who had that relationship with the owner um, and the PM, we were able to get instead cash deposit amounts over the last 12 months for this property. These ones were a combination of rent deposits and receipts from other income generated from this property. Now, here's where it gets more fun they gave us the total month over month balance. So what we couldn't tell what portion of that amount were deposits from rent versus other income, right? Uh, an auditor's worst nightmare. Okay, so unfortunately these are the cards were dealt and we had to work with what we got. So with that, uh, we, we took these cash deposits and compared it to accrual based financials that we had already received and Jen has already moved on to that slide there. Um, so you can see, oh, you can go back, yeah. So you can see here, 
The top row in blue is our cash deposit amounts that we had received those balances um, in thousands. And on the bottom number, that's our cruel numbers that we had received earlier at the onset of this deal. Um, and that's what we had used to build our performa in our underwriting, since that's all we had at the time. And you can see that quite frankly, the difference between cash and accrual for the first 10 months isn't all that bad. It was really the most two recent months that we see the spread on that difference start to double. 240, yeah, 47, 46. Now, if you're a visual person like me, I also threw this in a graph just to see what that spread would look like, particularly month 11, month 12. So seeing this, we, we decided to do an exercise of what the spread could look like if it were annualized. So starting with the T12, um, which is really just a trailing 12 months financials, we saw a $210,000 difference. But then this starts to basically more than double based on T3 or trailing three months and T1 or the last one month of financials of up to more than $50,000 difference spread. Now, this is a hypothetical but being auditors, we always look to the worst case scenario first and we reason our way back to safety. And in this case, I have to say it was a bit of a challenge. And, you know, it could be said, you know, just to pause here, it could be said that in any industry, in any market in general, um, we were all kind of remember this is like fourth quarter, end of third quarter, early first quarter of last year there was a lot, we were all kind of in a state of uncertainty with what the future would look like, particularly how quickly we could recover from an impact of a pandemic. Um, and quite frankly, since we were at the middle of it um, at the time, and we didn't have a vaccine, and then we were hearing of outbreaks of new strains appearing. So, you know, going back six months, this is where the state of, um, state of affairs were. And another point, uh, another point to share at this point is that at the time we submitted our offer, uh, which is back in mid-October, we didn't have this month 11 and month 12 data point. This is something that we got um, after some insistence and of course the help of our GP team near the end of our due diligence period. And the reason for this was just simply timing, right? So if we submitted our offer around mid-October, it meant that September month financials, which was month 11 in this case, um, were just about being wrapped up. And then clearly month 12 wouldn't have been available because the month wasn't even physically over yet at the time. So needless to say, we try to work through all these points before we had to sign PSA. Um, so what we decided to do was engage some of those backup levers that Maggie mentioned earlier, those cushions of reserves. Um, and so we started pulling those in. So one of the things that we did was before we were taking a 70, we had 70% of water savings in reserves. We started utilizing all of that in. And then we also tried switching over to a bridge loan scenario as another lever. You know, and as we were starting to do this exercise, we were starting to realize that this setback was a little bit too large for our comfort because it really would have needed for us to get this there is more time to stabilize the property, which could tie up our cash flow. And that could really impede on our ability to confidently deliver those investor distributions, particularly in that first year. And deal making is really about how comfortable you are able to deliver on your pro forma. And we were just worried with there being so many variables, so much of it that we couldn't necessarily control. Um, we felt that in concautious, we couldn't go through with it. So in the end, we decided that we would decide to walk away. Um, next slide. Yeah. No. And the timing was right for us because we were one day away from our money going hard and that we would have signed the PSA. And remember our initial deposit was $75,000 um, with a subsequent deposit going hard um, after um, due diligence period ended. So the question, what did all of this cost us? Well, it cost us give or take about $15,000 of due diligence, which may seem 
like a lot, but it could have been more. Um, of course, time, and we all know how valuable that is. Um, a little bit of sweat because there was anxiety, but definitely a lot of tears, which we'd still need therapy for. But on the flip side, um, what? because there is a yin to that negative yang, what was it that we saved? So, well, we saved ourselves, obviously, that earnest money that would have gone hard. We, it saved us additional costs that it would have taken to take this deal to close. Um, and last but definitely not least, we protected our and our co-GP investors' money from potentially difficult first few years. So the big question, was all of this worth it? And the answer is yes, absolutely. I mean, there are so many lessons learned. We have so much more appreciation of what it takes to close a deal. It was a painful lesson, yes, but sometimes it's just the cost of doing business. Um, and in this case, the biggest takeaway was a reminder for us that sometimes no deal is still a good deal. Okay, so that concludes our presentation. I will hand it over to Jen. Thank you so much, Maggie and Lana for sharing this story with our audience. Um, I hope everyone learned a lot today. Um, I know I do every time I hear it. So if you guys have any questions, um, feel free to either put in the chat box or you can unmute yourself and ask. And while I wait for, I see we might have one question. While I wait for more questions to come in, um, I, if you found this webinar to be inform, informative and helpful, um, and you know of someone who might be interested in learning more about investing in multifamily syndications, please feel free to refer us or invite them to um, our webinar series. And oops, let me go back. Not there yet. We can, oh, we have more questions. So we can go ahead and answer these questions before we conclude. I'm able to see them. Romani says, <laughs> um, oh, that's nice. Romani says, sometimes it takes more strength to let go. It was a smart move. Thank you for sharing your setback experiences and lessons. Thank you so much, Romani. Really appreciate that. So thank you so much. Does anyone else have anything to add or any questions that you guys might have? Maybe I can maybe chime in and maybe like, you know, a question um, that we got during the actual presentation um, in Dallas. Maybe, um, I guess, you know, if we could do this all over again, knowing what we know now, like how would we, how could this have been, um, I don't know, how could it have uh, happened differently? Maggie Rolana? Yeah. That, that was a question that came up quite a bit, um, even for us during, before we decided to walk away, what could we have done differently or had information up front before we sunk $15,000 of due diligence costs. Reality was um, it was an off market deal um, and we did want to try to get this before it was gonna get marketed or if it was gonna get marketed. We had the, the advantage of knowing the owners and knowing the property manager. And so we know that the property was well taken care of and it was a really good asset. At the end of the day, it really just came down to numbers and maybe it was circumstances, right? We were in the middle of pandemic. We didn't know there was so much uncertainty in the future. Um, ideally, what was really important to us and was a takeaway for us is we would have tried to get a cash-based T12. Um, and you can see throughout our presentation, there were so many attempts we tried to get it. Um, so in other deals, that's something that we asked for upfront. In the absence of a cash-based T12, you can get cash receipts like we did at this particular project. Um, in, or in other cases, something that we actually look for is something called an accounts receivable report or a delinquency report. And that will usually tell you if there is any large balances sitting on the account that hasn't reflected in the income statement yet, and just how old or how aging those will be. So something you can take into account. Um, and that's something we've also have been doing in the instance we can't get cash-based T12 or cash-based income statement, I should say. 
Thank you. Yeah. Yes. I think, yeah. Go ahead, Mary. So something to add is just that, um, you know, as maybe also for us as operators, we continue to make sure that we screen tenants uh, with figures and making sure that, you know, they can meet their three to one income ratio and not, you know, not justify and allow like lower their income level for a um, community like this one. Cause that when, when things gets heated up like a pandemic, and people are losing their jobs, it really hurts. And it really hurts the operation of this, all this uh, portfolio, as we can see in this particular property. Um, and then the other thing was that, uh, I think at that time, um, ourselves and also the brokers and everyone involved had, um, aren't quite really sure how to navigate a sell transaction where there is a balance. But I think like um, lately we've been seeing a lot more like earlier this year, um, brokers are recommending or it's more common to have something built into the contract where the owners have to provide an income guarantee or income collection guarantee where they would, uh, if there are ba bad balances on the rent roll uh, associated with tenant and they cannot evict them, uh, the owner will set aside, uh, um, uh, set aside an amount on escrow. And if, if the property continues not performing, we can, the buyer can draw from that escrow account. So, but that, at that time, I don't think the brokers or anyone in the industry are fully aware how to navigate this as well. So, um, where compared to now, so that's something that we uncover. Okay. Thank you so much, Maggie. That's mm -hmm. very nice. Um, and so we have another question here from Sarah. She said that in this particular scenario, it sounds like, only the sponsor team lost money. Is this right? Any experience where your investors lost money due to a bad deal? Thanks for sharing your story. I can um, I can take that one. Um, so yes, in this situation, you are right. Only the sponsorship team uh, lost money for the money that we paid to conduct the due diligence to bring the team out there uh, to walk all the units. And so, um, yep, so that's right. But in the in experience where our investors lost money due to a bad deal, um, fortunately, uh, no, no, uh, we haven't had an experience where investors lost money. And it's, you know, that's kind of one of the re one reasons why we do um, due diligence and any deals that we work on, we make sure, you know, that we uh, do really conduct really good due diligence on these deals just so that we can protect our investors, which is, you know, our number one priority. And by due diligence, it doesn't mean just, obviously we do due diligence on our own deals, like the one that we shared today, but even on deals that we co-sponsor, we're vetting their underwriting to make sure, are they sound? Are they justified? Are they reasonable, right? So, you know, it helps that we're all auditors and we've done this as a career. So we audit our own and other people's deals. And so we want to make sure that we're vetting all the deals that we put forth to our investors to avoid the situation or at least mitigate the situation mm -hmm. where our investors have the potential to lose money. That wouldn't be a scenario we would like. Right. And on top of that, you know, um, another reason why we believe so much in real estate and especially multifamily real estate is that, you know, it's, an, it's a real asset. Um, it's actually, you know, there are always risks in every end every investment, but the chance of like, you know, losing your money is, you know, a little bit, it's not, not very highly likely just because it's an actual asset. We've um, had situations where we know of other partners who had, you know, buildings burned down, right, at, at their properties. And even like what, two buildings, I think during the course of ownership and they've endured, you know, um, a lot of different incidents, uh, you know, that would give any owner like a huge headache. But, you know, despite, you know, all these incidents that happened, two buildings building down, um, I think like bad property managers. I mean, the market that they invested in was so strong and, you know, their, uh, the property, you know, was well taken care of. And because of the value add that they put into it, like they were, I mean, like they ex exited the deal. And I believe the investors were able to get like, I don't know, I forgot what the return was. Yeah, and keep in mind, this is where underwriting is so important because you have to build in your great insurance, right? It's a great insurance program. And most underwriters will also build in a contingency budget for rainy day funds or situations like that. And the whole point is to maintain operations um, 
and really not hit negative cash flow. You really want to make sure that the property maintains operation, even in the event that a building, or in this case, two buildings burn down due to a fire. Um, so kind of goes back to the fundamentals of making sure that you've underwritten a, a deal um, yeah. and the market can absorb that. Mm-hmm. And uh, just to add to that, like uh, in this particular deal, even like we were running uh, a lot of scenarios and, and we were ending up with the worst case scenario at 6% in uh, internal rate of return. So it didn't totally, um, it's not like losing money, but it's it's not a return that we like to um, to target or see or like in that range. And we don't feel confident that we can deliver the return that we want to share with investor. It doesn't make any sense. So we have to walk away on that. And a lot, I, and I want to say that a lot of times like it's this, the situation is not unique. It's part of our business. It's, it's part of the business expense. We have to run due diligence. We have to assess assess whether a deal is a go or no go for our investor. And we have to make that determination if it's for the benefit of the good of the whole entire um, team. So it is, you know, it is what it is. It's part of the process. So, yep. That was a really good question there. I really appreciate that. Um, we have another one from Romani. Um, she said, after this deal's experience and lessons learned, do you still have anything that you're most afraid of when making a deal? <laughs> you guys want to take that one? <laughs> it's a great question because personally, I am, I'm so risk adverse. Everything scares me. <laughs> um, but like, there's always going to be analysis paralysis, right? That's not being fearful doesn't, um, isn't also going to stop me from moving forward. I just have to be more equipped or better informed. Um, and it's really balancing that risk, right? Like there may be risk, but maybe the risk isn't as big that will hit, hurt my returns. Or if the risk is lead of it occurring is very minimal, you know, gathering all those data points. I'm, I'm, sort of a data freak. So I will research and collect as much information as possible. Um, But to answer your question, Romani, almost anything makes me afraid of a deal. Um, Yeah. And I, you know, a lot of, a lot of times, you know, there are a lot of assumptions that go under these, that goes into the underwriting. Right. And so there's always, you know, you know, Hey, am I making like good assumptions or bad assumptions? Right. And it comes with experience, knowing the market, doing your research, as Lana said, just to make sure that the assumptions that you're putting into the underwriting are, you know, as, um, you know, as, you know, as uh, concrete as possible. Right. So, I mean, if, if I had to say one thing and it might be relevant to this, to today's presentation would be um, balances aren't bad. But if there is a balance, especially if you're looking at something like 200, um, that's something I would definitely look into. And so it wouldn't, I wouldn't say I'm afraid of it, but I would certainly take, pay close attention to it. Yeah. To understand just, it better. Yeah. And just to add to that, like we, we talked about it internally, where we shied away with big balances um, on a particular property. And we've seen a couple that's coming in the market uh, when we are underwriting. Even today. Even today, and so, but we, um, I think we, we look to it. It could also be an opportunity as well, because you know, fundamental like like this particular property, it might be just a the property manager and their um, rigors of screening tenants. So that may be a potential opportunity for us to pick up, and uh, really, but we just have to account for it, and we also have to work closely with our um, property managers that's going to take over to see it, the strategic uh, way to, uh, you know, basically removing these um, tenants that's not paying and replacing them with high quality tenants. So it is an opportunity as well. So if, if we just look at a different lenses, so. Yep. Well, thank you. Yeah. Any other questions? Like those are some really, really good questions and we really appreciate you guys. Oh, and uh, so Romani said, can you elaborate on Sarah's question? Um, not saying that you will never make bad decisions and loss of money in the future because you ladies are very smart. Thanks. <laughs> but what would be your backup plan in terms of responsible uh, in terms of responsibility for return on investment for investors' money? Uh, yeah. I so if I, what would our contingency yeah. plan be um, in terms of protecting? 
Is that what right. it is? We're protecting our uh, return of investment for investors' money. Mm-hmm. Right. I think you have to, should... that's on set, you know, buying at a good basis, go looking at the fundamentals, uh, making sure that we are accounting for um, any any setbacks that could potentially occur and making sure that our budget is, is where it should be. Uh, I think it's on at the onset of underwriting. That's why underwriting is very important. If you account for it, you should be able to uh, foresee, anticipate, anticipate mm-hmm. what is coming. So, right. um, and then, and of course, I, yeah, go ahead, yeah. No, I was gonna say, but Romani, if I can, let's just say for some reason or another, we've done great under, like we, obviously we can't predict the future. So as thorough of an underwriting we can do, there's gonna be some, you know, certain things that may come up that we can't anticipate for, right? Like. At some point, no, I don't know how many could could have predicted like a worldwide pandemic, but it came. And so your question, I think maybe your question here is, if we were somehow put in this position, what could we do to make sure that we, you know, our stewards are of our investors' money? And that's a great question. I think um, it's really important to know who your operators are and how that deal is constructed. But generally, the first and foremost important thing is to make sure we are preserving our investment. So, you know, if an investor put in, say, 100K, the goal is to make sure that we don't lose more than 100K. That, like, that, with the, we preserve the 100K investment at worst case scenario. And then, um, and ways where we can do that is, again, um, I think was building in those contingencies into the budget to make sure we can dip into those funds in on years that we don't perform well and we don't have that cash flow to also, even in a situation during troubling times, general partners generally won't take part in any share of their returns until the investors are made whole first. And so it's important to kind of look for those terms such as preferred return or pref, you know, what we do is like a pref return 8% is you will get your return of capital first. So if you invested 100K, you get your 100K. And then if they said, you know, there is a pref return, then it's 8% on top of your original investment um, before the GP starts seeing anything. And the whole purpose is to make sure, again, GPs are last in line to receive any benefit, any performance from a property until all the other investors have been made whole first. But GPs are also in the hook because so it's a deal. Yeah. Yeah. Something- I don't know if that sort of answers your question. Right. And it's but- something we always share with our investors. It's um- it's nothing uh, different from buying any type of investment. That there is a risk to it. You, there's a risk, absolutely. Always. There's a risk to always. You can lose your entire uh, money, but it's not right. our. It's, it's not intention to to we, our first intention is protect and preserve that capital. Right. Uh, so it's almost like buying a investment property, like a a single family property. You want to make sure it stays afloat, even in the worst case of the time in the rainy days. You want to make sure you have enough reserve to pay down the the debt, so then it can still be running, and there's uh, that capital is still in there intact. And uh, you know, at least there's uh, when you sell it, you still have that return of capital back. That is all. That that is the first and fundamental, not to lose any money in the deal, and that's you know, ties back to our underwriting piece to make sure right. that we uh, incorporate that. And if you guys are interested in some of the technical aspects of where in the underwriting these are budgeted for, we certainly share that with you. Have a separate session going through that. Um, You know, just on the top of my head, some things would be looking at break even points, looking at where we pencil in our economic vacancy rate, the EV rate that we talk about. Um, So if those are areas that you are interested in, please let us know. Happy to kind of build something around that and present on that to show you how that's built into the underwriting. Thank you guys. Yeah, that was super thorough. Um, yeah, and you know, Romani can also talk to you like, you know, um, one-on-one too, a little bit more, give you like, you know, an example of um, a situation of another situation where, you know, maybe a property wasn't cash flowing, for example, but then, you know, the operator took other strategies to 
um, to maybe to perhaps exit de the deal so that they are able to return to the investors like um, the returns that they initially promised. So there's a lot of, you know, I think a lot of different ways to manage a situation depending on the deal since every deal is like so different, right? So there would be different contingency plans for each one, but as long as you make sure that, you know, each deal has good conting contingency um, funds, you know, in place, whether like you know any um any surprising events that may occur um you know then you know as long as you feel comfortable about that um it should be it should be fine i it's um always a risk but the chance of losing money is not super likely um from my personal opinion but yeah, well, thank you so much, guys. Um, yeah, that took us to like almost an hour presentation, which is totally fine. We really enjoy answering your questions and, you know, sharing this experience with you guys. Um, and so just to close it out, just thank you again so much for joining us today. Um, and I don't know if anybody is new here to our group, but if you haven't signed up yet, you know, we hope that you will consider joining our growing community of busy professionals who want to achieve more freedom, get more, get multiple income streams and to grow their wealth via real, real estate. Um, thank you so much and have a wonderful rest of the day. Take care guys.